Quite the interesting start to our Miami Grand Prix weekend. McLaren was actually the fastest car, but we have Max putting in another ridiculous lap on a very weird layout with these temperatures. The upgrades for McLaren is something I want to go over because it's a completely B-spec type car. This is essentially what they wanted when they were introducing their car in the winter. These are the first upgrades for their car. I want to go over that, but I also want to do some analysis and what we should expect in the sprint race, but as well as the big race and qualifying that we have on Saturday and Sunday. If you guys are new here, I'd love if you'd subscribe. We're killing it. You guys are amazing and you guys mean the world. So thank you so much. Let's get started with the McLaren upgrades first. I did cover the floor. That was the only thing that I really covered in my upgrades video, but I never covered everything else that came because we just officially got pictures. First thing we're going to look at is the side pod inlet. This is the old, the new one. This one is a little bit more skinnier in width wise, but also pushed up more for more of a undercut effect, which we will see better from a side angle. Looking at the side angle, you can see the difference between the Japan spec and their current spec. You can see the difference in that side pod shape, as well as how that inlet was now shaped to promote more undercuts and a airflow that's going now consistently from the front of the car to the back. Before it was a bit interrupted with their side pod design, now it's a more even flow, something similar to that of the Aston Martin, but the actual concept itself, this side pod design and the little downwashing part towards the end of it that you can see, which is kind of like a ramp on the RB20, is pretty much copied. This whole entire side pod design and really the McLaren car is really based off of Red Bull's designs, but they do a damn good job of implementing it in their own way and getting a lot of pace out of it that we just saw in Miami. You can see more of this ramp of what I'm talking about in this picture. You can see a side by side. The bottom one is the older spec. The top one is the newer spec of car. You can see how they've introduced this ramp, almost identical to that of the RB20. And something else that they've also been working on is this little wing cutout. Now this is part of their side impact structure. We saw this on the W14 as well. So it's not brand new, but I talked about why teams are implementing this idea of putting a overcut rather than a undercut on their side pod. And it's because the suspension causes a lot of upwash. It's why the RB20 has introduced it. Now McLaren is going for that same type of effort. And we can see that they've made it a lot wider than it was before. And with that new undercut as well in the car because of the side pod shape, it is pretty much going along the lines of the RB20 style. They've also introduced a front wing, which isn't severely different. We see a lot of teams have a strong start from the nose, sloping downwards towards the end plates. But now we can see that they've opened up some cuts towards the end plates, but the actual shape itself has been pretty consistent for the McLaren. A little bit of a more upwashy part in the middle of that wing. Here's another great picture in comparison from Miami and then also in Saudi. And you can see the differences between this car just slightly. You can see the side pod shape is a bit wider, but you can see what they've done with the wing a little bit better in this picture. The actual rear wing isn't new, but you can also see on the side pods that wing that I was talking about for that overcut is more profound now than it was before. With that out of the way, we can now talk about our classifications and analysis. Now, there's a lot to pick out of here because this was quite the interesting weekend start that we could have had. Now, I expected Williams to be bad. I didn't expect them to be this bad. They were quite off the pace. Yes, Alex made a mistake, but they were still quite a ways away. Kick Sauber, also a ways away. And Alpine, unfortunately, is a bit better, but still a lot more to gain to be at a RB or Haas level. But Yuki Tsunoda wasn't able to put in a nicely timed lap in Q2. I think there might've been a problem in the car because in Q1, he did okay. We don't see an actual Q2 lap time. So probably an issue for Yuki, but that's not to take away from his teammate having an outstanding qualifying. Kevin was great in Q1 and then lost to completely in Q2. Alcon did his best, but the biggest talking point definitely is going to be for Mercedes. Lewis and George, it's a super hot track. At some point, the track temperature was around 45 degrees Celsius. So we knew that these cars were just going to be sloppy out there. They were sliding and you can even see through that turn 16 under the highway that Lewis, specifically from his view, 
was sliding like crazy. He was trying to use the throttle to move that car more because of the complete understeer in the car from the tires going away completely. And he ends up giving a smooch to the wall over there before going on to the long straight. There were plenty of drivers that actually smooched the wall over there. It was quite common, but you don't lose that much time from it. It was just because of understeer and the tires eventually dying out. These tires only last for like a lap or two. We're definitely not going to see the softs in the race, but let's talk about Q3. So in SQ3, it was one lap, do or die, and McLaren were the favorites here. If you actually look at their Q2 time, Lando Norris's Q2 time was a 127.579, and Verstappen's was a 127.641 on the softs in SQ3. So I don't want to just go at Norris because he's been having an outstanding start and he did great last year as well. But the man does choke a little bit in these moments. He knows that himself. I don't really got to mention that as well. He said it himself. He said he made a mistake, but it could have been with tire warm up as well. Maybe the softs weren't working as well on the car, but he was eight tenths down in sector one. In sector two, he ended up sliding after a big braking zone as well. So they were mistakes eventually that ended up leading him to going down to P9 in SQ3. Lance ended up actually out qualifying Fernando, but we got to understand that the two of them have a different setup on the car. That's not takeaway from Lance. I think he's actually been a bit better in these qualifying sessions than Fernando, at least off of consistency. But Fernando was ahead in Q1 and in Q2, but in SQ3 where it mattered, Lance put in the lap, Fernando was sliding a lot in the second sector. They do have a different setup and I'm worried for Fernando's race pace because the car is much slower than what Lance has in a straight line. Oscar put in an okay lap, but the same thing, he had mistakes in the first sector. Sainz made a mistake towards the very end of the lap in SQ3. Going into that little hairpin, he made a mistake, locked up, and that put him behind Charles, but he was a little bit behind anyways. Now, Daniel Ricciardo, I mean, since the chassis change that I didn't think was going to change much, and most people didn't, but you know what? When you're the driver and you get the feel and you go over the chassis, obviously you're the one that knows whether this feels weird or not. And he's been proven in China, was ahead of Yuki. He was better, I think, than Yuki even showing in this qualifying. Would Yuki have gone up to P4? We don't know with the problem, but we gotta give our flowers to Daniel, who's done an outstanding job and is only two tenths off of Sergio. So that's amazing and quite close to a competitor of his. Leclerc did an amazing job after spinning and not having any lap time. Shows you how great of a qualifier he is and Max did what Max does. He's always impressive and quite the amazing driver. Now let's look at the top speeds because this is going to matter a lot in race pace trim. So looking at it, Sargent had the highest time of a 344 in sprint qualifying, but Logan was nowhere to be found. He did have the fastest sector three in SQ1. Lewis is down with a 334. It's going to be a painful weekend for the Mercedes. I'll tell you that. They're not going to make up places. It's going to be hot. They're I don't even know if it's going to be points for them. We're going to have to see. It's a tricky weekend all around. But when you look at it, you can also see Daniel Ricciardo with a 335 who put in a P4 position. So comes to show you there was pace to be found, but with the tires shredding up, it was a lot for the Mercedes to ask for, and that's why they failed. Looking at the McLarens, you can see that they've improved upon their pace, at least in top speed. They're 340, only two off of the Aston Martin. And Checo, who's also up there with the 342, and Verstappen is actually down 2 kph to the competitors of the McLarens. But considering the lap time and Lando choking up that lap, we're not going to really see the competition in the sprint. But in qualifying, they have a real chance at going at Red Bull if they put everything together. The car is in a much better place and consistent all around. And with this type of setup, with just one practice going into sprint qualifying, Looking at race pace data is pretty irrelevant. You can't really get much out of it. What we can look at is the DRS Delta that we had in FP1. So what speeds do the teams go from when the DRS is open and when it's closed? So if we look right here, Haas has the fastest car with DRS closed, meaning that they have probably the lowest amount of drag here, which was an issue that they had in sector one, but in sector two and three, they're gonna be deadly. I think Mercedes is gonna have a very difficult time if Nico can stay ahead in the first part of the race. Alpine's still slow. Aston Martin is still a lower draggy car, but still very effective DRS. Every team is around that 34 to 39 range, but McLaren was the quickest here. So still a little bit draggy without the DRS, but this is a big improvement upon what they had before. Overall, this is gonna be a very important race for teams that have the top speed over their competitors. Defending here is important, but overtakes happen a lot. There are three DRS zones, 
So staying within range for that DRS is also very important. I don't think we've had too many DRS trains here as well in the teams with the highest top speeds, but also the ones that qualified well have a chance. Now, I do think McLaren has a chance going into the actual race and qualifying, but Lando's got to stick it. It's a, been a problem in last year's season, in 22. It continues to be an issue. He's just kind of choking up those moments, but I hope that he finds that grip to get there. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and let me know what you guys thought of this format of the analysis, talking about it, top speeds, race pace, and so on. Love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below and do you guys want me to continue this throughout the weekend and future weekends ahead? Please leave a like, subscribe, and me in the world, and peace.